Welcome to the hard truth about B2B e-commerce. I'm your co-host, Isaiah Bollinger. Welcome to episode 73 with uh, with Tim. Well, hello, everybody. This is Timothy Peterson. Welcome. And uh, I made a joke last time about 1972. I actually do remember 1973. I was in third grade and my teacher was Mrs. Sampley. I have no idea if she's still around, but I remember. Uh, and I wanted to give uh, continue the tradition of a couple shout outs of people who are listening to our podcast. Uh, if, if folks know Steve Dennis, uh, he is listening to our podcast, which I think is fantastic. Uh, he is a retail and omni-channel uh, guy, uh, quite an expert uh, in industry leader. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad that you're listening. Uh, also, Pablo Pazmino. If uh, folks know Pablo, he has worked with many, many people on integration projects, transformation projects, whatever. Uh, he is quite a big deal, so thank you, Pablo. And I heard through the grapevine from one of my friends at Amazon that we have listeners at AWS. So hello, AWS. Wow. Wow, that's yes, impressive. We do. So that was <laughs> directly at Amazon. Uh, he did not want to name himself because he wasn't sure. When are they going to hire us, right? When is Amazon going to, you Amazon know, can, uh, hire we're, ready, we're ready for our seven, you know, eight figure contracts, Amazon, you know. But I will be at the <laughs> AWS Summit next month in Javits Center in New York. So if anyone wants to reach out before that. Oh man, I probably need to show up there. Can you, can you remind, can you remind me of when I that will, is? Yeah. I will remind you, but I just want to give, that's our tradition of shout outs now that we're, we're continuing with. So listeners reach out to us tell us what you're hearing what you like what you don't like especially what you like though you know if you could tell us more of that and now i'm just going to pause for a moment so we can insert our sponsor mentions then throw it back to isaiah for our fantastic guest today our first sponsor is punch out to go punch out to go is a global b2b integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and erp applications punch out to goes iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. With their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents in order to accelerate business results. Balance is our other sponsor. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com, book a session, and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. All right, welcome, welcome back and uh, very excited. I, I, I can't believe this is our first time having you. We're having uh, TJ Gamble, who's been a, a friend of ours for a long time, uh, CEO of Jamerson. Uh, so thank you, thanks for joining. And, and tell us about, you know, for people that don't know you, uh, not everyone's a YouTube uh, star, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, again, my name's TJ, uh, CEO and founder of Jamerson. Uh, we're we're an agency, much much like Trellis. Um, I, I guess I'd probably be most well known for the YouTube content that we put out. We, uh, you know, being a, a small agency geographically located in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, we started many years ago trying to find a way to stand out, and, and content was one of those ways. Um, and by the way, if, if Amazon is listening, I don't know what they would hire you for. They seem to have it figured out. <laughs> like, I don't know how you're going to help. Them. You know, who knows? Who knows? But I think I, the I only way that. they would hire us is for some sort of staff, you know, just because staff augmentation type thing, just because they probably, they're always hiring, you know? So, you know, they might need more help, you know? They might need more people, more <laughs> yeah. people in the C-suite, you know? And here yeah. I am. I'm just we'll take a C-suite, a part-time C-suite job, you know? <laughs> I, I have this rule where we're probably not a good fit for a business that has more janitors than we have employees <laughs> that's a really good way that's a that. that's a good rule that that is, but you guys you know i know you've worked with some larger customers 
Um, but yeah, let's let's get into it and uh, tell us about you know just maybe a brief history of how you kind of got into B two B commerce. It's probably similar to how I did, which is you're doing e commerce, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a sec, there's this whole B two B segment, and they need help too, and not really it feels like no one's figured it out and no one still has figured it out <laughs> we're you know <laughs> 10 years into me doing it uh and probably same thing with you with you know magento big commerce and it still feels kind of like in some ways it feels like the wild wild west a little bit with b2b um well that's what i like about it uh being an engineer myself you know very technically focused run a very technically focused agency and so we like technical challenges and we tend to gravitate toward industries that have those technical challenges. So we do a lot of automotive and, and then obviously B2B because you've got huge SKU counts, crazy buyer journeys, and Lord knows what kind of back office systems they're going to be running. When did that moment hit you? Uh, or maybe it wasn't a moment, but a period of time where you're like, hey, you know, there's something here and we need to like seriously focus on this B2B stuff. Uh, and take it more seriously versus like, you know, your traditional just retail B to C. I, I mean, I don't do. A, I don't know if there's a moment, right? As a as a business owner, you're usually just following the paychecks, right? <laughs> that's what got me into e-commerce. I was trying to build WordPress sites. I'm trying to build e-commerce sites. I was like, these e-commerce people pay. Like, let's go that route, right? You <laughs> could you could actually quantify the value that yeah. you're bringing to them. Yeah, and and B two B is a lot like that, right? Being uh, again, being more technically focused, a lot of our a lot of our revenue, a lot of our work is in the engineering side of things, figuring out those problems, building solutions, writing code, and the fact that B two B usually has more complexity. Uh, there's just more opportunities for us to provide that value and help them overcome those things. Uh, so it's I think it's always been. Uh, an area of focus for us, at least as far as, you know, looking for those opportunities. Oh, well, what would you say has shifted though? You know, I think uh, from my perspective early on, it was kind of like convincing people that it was even something they should consider. Yeah. And I think there's less of convincing that, although I still sometimes see that they do need to be convinced. And now it's more of a, how do we do it? <laughs> and, B2B is behind B2C. It's, it's very far behind the B2C curve. And, and so a lot of businesses have been, our model works. We have sales reps and they call a bunch of people and people call them and they like talking to the sales reps. And we've got, you know, our customers are, are aging and have been with us for 30 years. And they're, part of it is, is starting to see their competitors do better. Uh, part of it is now their customers are maybe aging out and retiring and they're starting to see the buyers for their customers get younger and want more technology. And if in this day and age, if somebody's needing to convince you that you need to do e-commerce really well, you are way behind. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you know, yeah, that... I'll, uh, I'll just share one little anecdote because I haven't shared this one before. I, I, I'm talking with a manufacturer uh, and a parts manufacturer, a restaurant supply manufacturer. Uh, they also have a service wing. Uh, I'm a little reluctant to mention their name because they don't know I'm mentioning them right now. However, they do know that they need to get some work done. They do know, but they all uh, readily admit that they're behind, you know, that it's, it, they probably should have done this three years ago, five years ago. When should we have had this conversation? It's like, well, when did you, when did you get a website? It's like, you know, when should we have had this conversation? So it really is something that they're recognizing, uh, but it's going to be expensive and it's going to take a lot of time. It's not going to be easy for them. They're huge. Where, they're global. where, where do you see the, the, the companies going wrong? Let's say they do, or they're like, all right, we, we, we need to do something but we're not really sure what to do what platform is it that they're choosing the wrong platform hiring wrong people you know not spending enough money uh, i'm just kind of curious what i mean it's kind of all of the above but like what are what are some of the common things that you're like man like seems like we just keep seeing this mistake over and over <laughs> well i think a lot of it is internal resources uh, you see with b2c you've got a lot of people understanding that retail it is e-commerce these days, yeah. like, you know, in-person retail for most people is secondary to e-commerce. And for so e-commerce is driving a lot of awareness in, in retail, right? Sure. It's like, yeah. it's like 
digital marketing is like, we got, we need to get our Facebook and our to e-commerce and then maybe they come to the store, but it's like very front and center, right? Cause that's yeah, it, and it could be driving in-store purchases. I'm not saying in-store is dead or anything, but no. th those businesses understand that. And so they tend to hire people internally that have initiative in e-commerce. So it could be an e-commerce director, or it could just be a marketing person that now understands they need to be pushing e-commerce. B2B, lots of times they don't have that person. And so you've got someone maybe that's over marketing or over sales that is now tasked with e-commerce and they have no e-commerce background or experience. They're, you know, really good with the, you know, the kind of manual B2B sales approach, but they don't know anything about e-commerce and they end up passing the, the buck off to IT to say, hey, we need e-commerce. And then IT's like, well, we're, we, we host, we know how to run our infrastructure we keep our ERP up. We don't know anything about e-commerce. And then they start reaching out to folks to try to build e-commerce, but there's not that really strong internal champion that really understands how e-commerce could transform this brand. And, and what you end up doing is you end up having two or three different siloed people or groups of people with different agendas or different understandings of how this is going to work conflicts and, of interest sometimes exactly yeah. and it's yeah. really hard to kind of bridge all of those together and get a solution that's actually going to function for this business well i'm i'm so glad you said that because we've been working on kind of like our summary diary playbook from this podcast of all the people we've talked to and we've learned and it's like we kind of almost call this the pre-step where it's like step <laughs> pre-step before you even do anything is like who is gonna lead this initiative and they need to have authority i think that's also part of it is like hey marketing guy go figure it out but the marketing guy he, he can't control budget he has like no budget he you know he the it guy won't listen to him because he's not in charge like they have such little authority to so it needs to be almost like a vp type responsible to the ceo kind of level person yeah. that's how i kind of see it like vp of commerce or vp of digital transformation whatever you want to call the person but they need to be a very serious person in the company that can like cross departments you know uh get things done essentially and people listen to them and without that person i agree i mean i think you're just gonna you're gonna you're gonna be unhappy you're gonna spend money with a trellis or jameson and you're gonna be like oh and, and i feel like what happens is agencies sometimes become the scapegoat right they become the scapegoat for the you know person that wasn't really qualified or in a position to succeed and you know, then they built the site, but then the site doesn't get adoption because the sales team doesn't care, mm. <laughs> you know, and they... <laughs> yep. they're, they're gonna, they're not gonna go all in because they don't understand how successful it could be. And then it's going to be a self fulfilling prophecy. It, it, exactly. It's essentially set up for fail. So what would you, you know, and I think that titles do kind of matter. Would you see this as like almost like a VP type position or director kind of like, what would you kind of recommend? that they hire director of e-commerce or how, what have you seen, I guess, maybe that you seem, seem seems to work well in these B2B organizations. Where well, it depends like, on the size of the business, right? Like, like you said, it needs to be someone that has authority over e-commerce across all of the divisions of your particular enterprise. And so if it's smaller, it, it literally just could be the marketing person. It could be someone that, that reports to the owner. We've seen that a lot, right? Someone that's, Maybe they don't have an e-commerce title. Maybe they do, but they report to the owner. Um, they can have some sway over IT and resources there. They have budget. Um, on a larger scale, it, it probably is going to be that VP role that you're talking about. Yeah, some sort of VP of commerce or operations yeah. or something where they have some pretty solid power. I mean, um, one thing I, I would add to this, too, is that some one of the companies I was working with, again, manufacturer, right, they were trying to figure out what they were going to do, and they did not have somebody dedicated for e-commerce. They originally suggested, let's have a task force, so, you know, we'll, oh, we'll oh, e-commerce <laughs> task force. And I, and I said, you know, this sounds like it's an outer space thing, or, you know, the task force, you know, and I said, you know, let's look at the number of hours that all of these you know, senior level people are supposed to now devote to a whole new area that they're not expert in. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess we should look at it a little differently. And they ended up 
hiring somebody as a VP of e-commerce and, and now they're doing quite well, right? So it, it does make a lot of sense for you know a business of a certain size to just keep moving it along, get that expert in and keep going. It's probably cheaper for them to, because then they saves all those other executives times to focus on their jobs. And yep. that's always a red flag I see is uh, to your point, uh, DJ is when like, it's not someone's full-time responsibility. And then it's like, you know, it's going to be a monumental process with B B2B commerce and culture change. And it's not even their full-time job. Like they still got to maintain the ERP. I've seen this where like the guys, the IT guy, and he's still, he's got to keep the lights on with the ERP of like a giant organization with all the like craziness of logistics. And it's like, how can you possibly do that and build this entire e-commerce infrastructure? You know, something's going to fall down, you know? <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot enact change in an organization unless that change is your primary focus. Yeah. So when I, you know, even when we hire internally, if we're trying to change something, uh, that can't be someone's part-time job. Yeah. So let's say you got this person. They listen to TJ. <laughs> uh, usually I would say it's, it's next step is kind of the infrastructure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, I really believe, you know, obviously if you're Amazon, you know, which we were joking about Amazon's, I guess, amazingly Hi, has, 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 listens to us, which is, is I guess, uh, cool. I mean, it's, it's, cool. it's definitely, uh, uh, I guess, a compliment. Uh, you know, there's the big companies that can afford custom and it kind of makes sense for a certain size, but we're trying to help the people that can't afford custom, which is like 99% of the businesses out there. You probably want to build around a platform. Um, what are you seeing in the ecosystem? Um, you know, obviously we, we both have kind of a little bit of a bias towards Magento and big commerce, but just kind of curious what you're seeing out there. Maybe it's a little different than what we're seeing, but. Yeah, I had a, some interesting conversations literally last night with uh, a large organization that has written everything custom. And so their ERP is custom, their e-commerce is custom. And, it, and then you're like, so are you a software company? <laughs> they, they have 100 developers internally. Wow. So yeah, they are a software company. Wow, yeah. wow. Um, but they're not really a software company, right? So it's custom. custom is a trap for a lot of people, it, it sounds wonderful. And what they're thinking is, is that we can eliminate any inefficiencies and build tremendous scale because they're trying to do 100,000 orders a day through, through their e-commerce. And they're just like, there's no inefficiencies because we wrote every line of code. Like they don't, I don't even think they use frameworks. It's a lot of Java stuff. So I guess a little bit, a little bit of Java framework there, but it's, and it's, it's fine, but the problem you run into is you build this custom thing exactly like you want it. And it could be exactly like you want it, but is it exactly like you want it a year from now or two years from now? And as the industry changes, your needs change, your buyers change, what that custom does is become an anchor because it has no agility to it. Yeah. And if you want to change any part of it, then it is a big intrusive so, endeavor. Um, so I, yeah, custom is not, unless you're like biggest of the big customers. Yeah, you about. have a CTO and you have a visionary technical, you know, roadmap. But to, to your point, I think what's even also what I see with this too, and we're dealing with a, a few of these uh, where we're kind of embedding some technology. They're actually buying some things to add to the tech stack so sometimes what's interesting with custom is you kind of buy and build. So there's like a mix sometimes where you can kind of do a little bit of both. Um, and they're, we're helping them with some of the implementation of, of uh, uh, in this case, actually in both cases, I think it's big commerce, which is kind of interesting. We're seeing them become a decent choice or like a more favored choice for custom people to buy something because they do have good APIs and they can kind of embed into the back end from like mm -hmm. a headless perspective. But what's interesting with these, we have a, both, both are in similar situations. If you don't have good documentation, so what they don't realize is like, oh, it's, it's internal. We don't need documentation because we're not a public product. But then if you don't have documentation, how do you onboard new developers? Right. What happens when you lose your, some developers and you got to replace them or you lose like top talent, especially if you're not culturally, you know, Google, Facebook, whatever it's probably pretty hard to retain the top talent and the engineers. You're going to lose some and then you got to replace them. And then 
no one knows what the hell is going on because it's all written by some guy from 20 years ago or whatever that like you said it's like you got to like go into the plumbing to figure out what's going on and there's well, it's so you hard know, you know another angle i would just put out there and i think you just basically you said this tj you know, so like you know if you have 100 developers are you a software company because re really that's the question to ask like if i'm coming in and i'm going to consult with somebody it's like well what is what is the point of your business is the point of your business to sell this product or this service or or is it to employ 150 developers to just keep updating things all the time right what is the point of your business right so it, it's a question that sometimes people get really weirded out about but it's valid it's, it's like you know you need people to keep things going and to support and to progress and do that up, but you don't need to well it could be a competitive advantage right i mean like tesla you know they're manufacturer but they also probably yes. have one of the best Absolutely. software engineering but you have to have that like leadership and that visionary aspect to to sustain that i think otherwise you just kind of end up with a legacy software team <laughs> tesla tesla is a tech company they are selling yeah. that software. yeah yeah yeah, yeah right, right. Well, right. I'm saying there are, there are companies where you're selling software and you can still have a manufacturing component and it makes sense, right? right? But there's a school yeah. supply company, for example, I worked with uh, some years ago. They're fantastic. They're one of the biggest suppliers for you know uh, schools at every level, all the way through the university level of anything, right? Do they need 100 developers? Not really. You know, that's not the point of what their business is. It just didn't make any sense, you know, for a business like that, you know, to be doing it. Well, especially now when there's so many great options out there and, and custom, I understand the need to customize things because B2B is oftentimes very unique per, you know, per business and, and, you know, your buyer's journey and the systems they need to interact with and where you've got your data stored. There's a lot of customization in that, Sure, but the commerce side of things, like that's pretty much the same for everybody. You're running a transaction through a credit card, not something you need to write from scratch. The yeah. cataloging aspects, the even per, even purchase order, because a lot of them, they, a lot of these platforms have the ability to do purchase order and the other types of payments. So you don't need to reinvent that wheel, I would say, for the most part. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, you could pick um, an Adobe Commerce that's open source that you can use as a framework to build on, or you could pick something. Uh, a commerce tools, a big commerce, like pick your platform of choice. I don't really care which one you choose, but they're all API driven at this point. And so why not leverage what they do really well to get you 90% of the way so that all you've got to do is build and maintain the 10% to make you different. So what, you know, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, let's say you've got your internal champion and you got to build around this platform, you know, trying to take our biases out of this. What are the platforms you think uh, people should evaluate because I think it, it can be a little overwhelming, right? I, I don't have time to evaluate 100 platforms, right? You know, I think you got to take a look at Big Commerce. I think you got to take a look at Magento. But I think there are some other options in the market that people should consider, depending on their situation. You know, there are 8,000 e commerce platforms at this point, I think, with barely exaggerating there. It's there's a new one pops up on the radar every day. Uh, but I think that's the problem. You, those fringe platforms, I think, is it's might as well go custom, in my opinion. <laughs> well, yeah, my, agreed, agreed. This is this is what I typically recommend. You want to look at all the mainstream platforms to see if they you know work for you. Like look at look at Shopify. Heck, I, I'm not saying I don't think Shopify will work too well in a complex B2B environment, but it's worth your time just to evaluate that a little bit. Um, Big Commerce has really good B2B. Uh, you've got obviously Adobe Commerce, Magento. Um, but anything that's mainstream, because one of the biggest benefits of choosing an e-commerce platform is third-party support and cutting down your development time. And if it's not a super popular platform, if it's fringe, if it's just popped on the map, then you're not going to have that third-party support. And there's a likelihood it's not going to make it. Like not, All of these platforms are not going to make it. We're going to have a significant consolidation so pick one that's been around for a while for sure that's pretty solid support i'm surprised it hasn't happened more yet <laughs> like i don't know how these guys are still you know surviving some of these other platforms i mean i woocommerce you know because they have wordpress and it's open source i think that's you know that's going to survive commerce tools has got you know decent momentum they're going to survive you know optimizely is probably going to survive because they consolidated i think you saw they they bought insight 
that's how they i think when they say b2b they really mean oh well we bought insight <laughs> <laughs> so they've got that kind of like conglomerate going well, I think um, one of know. the things that that happened at some point in the last, like, I'll say five to 10 years is that there are a lot of these like boutique bespoke kind of platforms that are really category specific and they, they market themselves that way. It's like, I, I'm for jewelry, you know, and, yep. you know, for both B2B and B2C, and they have like 40 or 60 of the major players in that space. And then that's it. They stop. You know, they put the box around it and they say, we have all the major players in jewelry. So I know, uh, you know, platforms like that. And it's like, but do I really want that? You know, if I were in one of these companies, the answer is no. I mean, I, I've been <laughs> a few of these powers, and the answer is no, I don't want that. But that's how they survived in a way. It's like kind of convince these people it's a, a community, you know, an ecosystem. I, I think that's where businesses get fooled is they're like, oh, because jewelry we're so unique and we sell shoes or whatever it is. It's like, you no, know, commerce is commerce. Consumers buy everything through credit card and a few ways, credit card, cash, maybe an invoice. Mm -hmm. There's really only like four or five ways you're going to pay. Right. And it's like all this, like you said, TJ, it's like, it's all been kind of built before with these popular platforms and shipping. There's a million shipping add-ons. A lot of this stuff has all been built, right? You don't, you just kind of have to put it together from, you know, well, that's, I think that's the benefit of the third party ecosystem. Uh, these little niche platforms, for instance, in automotive, I mentioned we do a lot yep. of automotive stuff. And yep. in, in automotive, there's several of them yep. that really focus on automotive and they do the fitment and, you know, choosing your vehicle and all of that stuff. Uh, in a mainstream platform, you're going to have to go to the third party marketplace to add that functionality or write it yourself. So that's, that's kind of where they stand out is that they provide that industry specific functionality but they do it on a mediocre e-commerce platform and so choose a mediocre e-commerce platform that's got some mediocre functionality built in or choose a really good e-commerce platform look to the third party for better functionality than you're going to get from that other guy and then you may have a few little things you have to build so if you have the you know as long as the budget is not constraining you to kind of those niche platforms, I, I don't see very many cases where they turn out a better product than building on a more- Do, do you have platform. any examples or, you know, anecdotes of when, have you ever migrated someone off one of those and been like, look how awesome this was once we got you on a better platform and improved oh, Of course, it. of course, lots of those, you know, cause they'll, on automotive, they'll have the fitment and the different things. And you look at big commerce and you're like, well, it, doesn't have fitment well it does you're just going to have to integrate a third-party search that has fitment no problem mm -hmm. and then they they move over and they're like well look at all of these merchandising tools and promotional stuff and content management that we didn't have on the other platform we were sacrificing all of that just because this one didn't have fitment out of the box yeah and it's almost like they're they're sacrificing their whole rest of their business for like one or two features right how many and, times yeah. does that happen where you get locked in, you're like this marketing. I don't know if it's, I don't know what it is, but you get locked in on this thing as the problem. This is your enemy right here. This one thing is your enemy and I have to fix this problem. And you ignore all of the other things that your business is affected or that affects your business in this project to lock in on this one thing, fitment. I got this, I got to solve this. So I need a platform that has fitment out of the box, or I need a platform that's open source. Why? I don't know, but I need one that's open source. Or I need <laughs> one that's SaaS. I don't want open source. Why? I don't know. I just know this. And it, <laughs> there's so many times we talk to folks that are just laser focused on one thing that is, it, okay, it might be important in the grand scheme of things, but it is not the most significant thing that they should be focused yeah, on. Yeah, it's like, how many people actually use the Fitment? Maybe it's only 10% of the customers and you find out it's only like a little piece of the business and then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, it's I, it's crazy how people get locked in like that. It's it's like headless. I'm seeing that with headless a lot mm. now. People come and they're like, we want headless. Well, why do you want headless? <laughs> I, I don't know that's it i, I, I was okay. i was gonna ask you because we did a headless talk uh could you bring me back I've, I've learned a lot i've done a lot more i have a much better sense of i think where to recommend and not recommend headless so we should do another uh little little thing on your uh youtube live stream let's do that yeah yeah no i i totally agree i mean i do think headless though what what is 
interesting about headless is I think in some cases it can be good for B2B if they can afford it. I think you definitely need a bigger budget with headless, but the headless flexibility does help B2B in the sense that they might have a lot of like crazy different things going on in the back end. You kind of unify it into the front end, you know? My general recommendation is if you are going to go through and handcraft your entire buyer's journey, if you're really wanting to fine tune every aspect of your website, headless can be great for that. Like that's going to allow you to get the best possible experience you can. If you're not going to do that, then it's probably just extra money for no reason. And also to add to that, I really think you need to be able to spend, you know, top notch money on design, user flows, wireframing, front end development. Obviously then you got to integrate a lot of stuff because there's more integrations and custom work. I mean, Honestly, I, I would say you're probably looking at significant six figure budget. And if you're not, if that like scares you away, or if you're worried about that, then you should be not serious about headless. <laughs> <Most definitely. laughs> and, and then you need to realize that you need to realize at that point, what you've done is, is you've chosen a third party provider for your e-commerce platform, theoretically. Uh, and then because you get that agility and flexibility, and now you've built a front end that is very custom and loses a lot of that agility and flexibility. Yeah. You lose all of it, but you do lose some of it. Yeah, we had a lead that we passed on, but somehow they went live. Uh, I'm curious, it's one of those things where like, you never know, like, are they actually doing well? Are they happy? Are they running into issues? And I think they had a 100K budget and they wanted a full redesign, headless, all this stuff. And I was just like, I don't think it's enough. <laughs> and they they somehow went live. I, I checked the site. It did look like they went live with headless, but it's, I'd be curious to know, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they're running into all sorts of like post-launch headaches and maintenance headaches. Because that's the other thing, the maintenance is, you know, you gotta you gotta factor in some solid maintenance budget, you know. I mean, you don't have to if you don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can build that's, you a headless yes. site for five grand. <laughs> Call me. Tomorrow's a Saturday at this point. I will build you a headless site for five I'm grand. Flick, flick it on, and then off I go. It's going to say no, what? Hello, gonna... hello world. And, you know, it's going to be I'm going to install. I'm going to install Magento. I'm going to throw up PWA Studio. I'm going to throw, I'll even put your logo in the corner. <laughs> and then I'll, it's yours. Go for it. Have a good time. I usually charge $500 just for logo in the corner. So, yeah, there you go. It's free with me. It's free with you. I want the $5,000 package. So, so let's say you've done your evaluation. You've got your platform. Um, do, you, do you think, you, you know, probably you're going to look for an agency? Um, where, where does you see you go from there? Like what, what kind of advice do you have for people as, as they get further into the journey and yeah, it, it really, again, depends on the business. Uh, most folks, you're going to probably want to engage with an agency before you settle completely on a platform of choice, right? Mm -hmm. Like obviously the agency experience and the implementation and the implementation costs are probably going to weigh into that platform decision process. Yeah. Um, so you, you want to do that a little early on and, and you can go out and find some, like you could listen to great podcasts and, and you know, come to Trellis, or you can watch a YouTube video and come to us, or you can ask the platforms that you're evaluating for a couple of options, and they'll usually recommend some. Well, you know, I'll, I'll mention one other path that people have often taken, because, you know, I'm kind of a free agent at this point. I've done a lot of different things, but I get out there, and I always tell people I'm not in anyone's pocket, right? You know, I'm, I'm really not. Yes, you know, so I could just say, here's what I really think. So right now I'm actually working on this project that's like ridiculously sensitive because it's a, there's a platform, you know, involved and all the players with the platform that the company's currently on, it's a multi-billion dollar company. And then there is an agency that specializes in this platform. And then here I am, right? And I'm supposed to come in and say, I don't like the platform or I don't like the agency or both or neither. Right. And, and that's what happens too sometimes. It's like, well, how do we make a decision if we already have these things in place? How do we figure out if we're locked into something that doesn't make sense? Right. And that's tough yeah. for a lot of businesses of any size. Yeah. I, I have seen, we, we talked to a company, they had, I, we found out they'd already bought a platform, a new platform. And it's like, to your point, I mean, it made no sense. Uh, 
Uh, I actually asked the platform, they don't have any traction. So it's like, I'm not sure if they're paying for the platform or what kind of deal they worked out, but it's really weird. where like, they basically had bought the platform, but had no yeah. real like tangible plan to actually get onto it. <laughs> so yeah, they have no idea. Now they could find out that the implementation cost is going to be five times what they expected. And that platform decision is just null and void and they're stuck in a contract. Exactly. Yeah. They're like, well, we didn't budget for the implementation. So we just wasted a uh, contract on a platform. So I agree with you. I think that's important. Um, one, let's say you get up and running and, and what, what are you seeing from, you know, some, maybe the, the good, the, the more successful B2B companies, what are they doing? Are they innovating more, adding new features, just being more agile? Maybe it's just the way they're marketing. Are there anything that you're seeing out there that were like, Hey, this is what, this is working <laughs> and you should do this. <laughs> the most successful companies make sure their sales team is completely on board with their e-commerce. And so you don't need to make e-commerce separate from the sales team. You need to try to integrate them as much as possible and make sure your sales team is leveraging the website. That's how you're going to get early adoption and that's how it's really going to grow, right? So if you if you try to de-incentivize them, if they're not getting commissioned on sales through e-commerce or something like that, you're you're probably making a mistake. Um, that's that's probably and, and then really focusing on what your buyer needs from you and making that super easy on them. I mean, this is not rocket science. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Like a lot of people overcomplicate this. It's like they want to find the product. They want an, an information about the product, which is good product data. It's, it blows my mind how like little effort people put into product data and they don't, they don't, <laughs> it's like, they're like, oh, we want SEO. But then it's like, well, you know what you should do? Work on your product data. That'll probably help your SEO, you know? <laughs> In a B2B environment, oftentimes highly technical specifications matter a lot more than it does in B2C. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, is there anything that you saw that those companies did in particular to engage their sales teams and get them on board? Was there anything where like, Hey, that's pretty cool. They, you know, had an all hands on deck meeting or I know sometimes it's tough to know sometimes what they're actually Well, I mean, doing. I would involve them early, <laughs> right? Like involve them before the project even starts, make sure they have a voice in the project from the beginning. What would help them do their job better? What are their concerns with the project? Are they concerned with, you know, losing revenue or, or losing customers to it? Uh, and then try to work through those and make sure all of those questions are answered so that the day it launches, it's a celebration across your organization and you don't have half the folks celebrating and half the folks cringing and crying in the bathroom. Well, you know, I, I love what you just said, because I think that it, you have to have all of the key people involved, you know, along the way especially sales. So it's critical for sales. Another thing I'd mention is having a customer panel or whatever you want to call it, you know, where you're, you're getting that feedback from your, your clients and your, your customer base, whatever you call them, you know, along the way, you, you've got to get that. And, you know, sometimes you're not asking about the e-commerce situation specifically, but sometimes you really do need to, and you have to say, well, what would be easier? What would you prefer? Do you want to do stuff on your, your phone with an app? You know, like you just ask whatever you have to ask based on what your business is and then feed that in, you know, to the sales team, have the sales team happy about all of these things and then address it. I mean, uh, it's I a feedback loop. I wonder if there's a, you know, almost a process you could deploy, which is to analyze which sales reps get the most website adoption. Like look at their, you know, let's say each sales rep has their book of business and figure out which ones are bringing the most to the website and there's probably like a a story there right they maybe believe in it more they're signing people up or training them on how to use it and then there's probably some that are doing less of that and maybe they they're gen there. z yeah you know, i mean i'm not <laughs> i'm not exaggerating that i mean just think about who a lot of the sales folks are coming out of college or you know younger sales folks it's not that you know people my age are not going to be embracing this too but you know, that's the expectation, I think, of, you know, people who are coming into the, into these uh, companies, you know, they're not going to expect that they have to fax something or fill out a form that, you know, on paper, you know, they're not going to expect any of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, tell us, uh, tell us any other, uh, any, anything interesting you're doing in B2B that is just like, you know, a cool kind of story about 
something maybe more innovative, not not just the nuts and bolts that. Oh, that's a tough question. So you put me on the spot there because B two B is usually very dry and boring. Right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have like the that, that's why we're like that's why we're the only <sighs> podcast. We're like the only real podcast. <laughs> what what about like a metaverse distribution center where I'm buying only with crypto? Yeah, integrated that? with TikTok, and then you know, just kidding. <laughs> on, the, on the B two B side, no, it, it is B2B usually side. just really big complex integrations and moving a bunch of data right it's and and some interesting buyers journeys there but well how can you make that a sexy story right how can you make that a, a fun story right there you go <laughs> i don't know i don't know i'm not i'm not gonna be able to come up with an answer to that on this podcast for sure you know i'll 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 give you a pause and let you think about this because i had another thing i wanted to ask you we can go come back to this i mean so I want to go back in into the time machine and, and bring you back to like, you know, you're an 11 or 12 year old on your skateboard. Like, did you think you'd be doing this? Like, where, <laughs> what's the arc? Like, how did you get from wherever you were to wherever you are? Like, what, what happened during that path? Well, first of all, 11 or 12 years, I didn't have a skateboard because I lived in the country. All we had was dirt. Um, it's hard to ride a skateboard. Dirt, dirt. and rocks. <laughs> we had yeah. dirt and rocks. Um, <laughs> how I got here, that's, that's a... When I was a junior in high school, they put in dial-up internet in our school library. And I picked it up pretty quickly. And after about a month, I was the person the librarian called every time it didn't work. So every time somebody came in there and couldn't figure it out, they would call me out of class. And I, I pretty much spent half of my senior year of high school in the library playing on the computer, fixing the computer, scanning, you know, just helping people do things. And then went to uh, Auburn University, and I wanted a job building websites. And I had some friends that worked for Dr. Barnes Instructional Media Group at Auburn University, building websites for the departments. Hmm. And I was like, "That sounds like fun." I'm working in the registrar's office. I'm like, I'm like pulling all the old records from the early 1900s and scanning them and stuff. And so I was like, "I want to build websites. So let's let's do that." Um, at beg for a job for months, Dr. Barnes called me and he said, I've got a job for you. So I immediately put in my notice, went over to Dr. Barnes's office. He sent me to the film lab. Hmm. So Auburn, Auburn is an agricultural school. And yep. so my job was to scan the old 35 millimeter slides of animal experiments and digitize them to CDs which is not even close is the worst job that I had <laughs> not even not even close to building websites so <laughs> but what turned what turned what was actually the luck in that story is that the film lab in 1999 in Auburn Alabama was the only place in town that had a really good digital camera they had like a $25,000 wow. Nikon digital camera and so the few stores in town that were doing e-commerce would bring their products there for their product shots. Ha, huh, that's great. <laughs> and so they, you know, the gentleman who was doing the job before me was a full-time employee. He left to go to college of education. They replaced him full-time with me part-time and he was doing their web stuff. He was like, not good at it. He was not good at it. Um, I'll tell you about the first website I took over here in a second, but he didn't have time anymore. So they were looking for somebody and the film, the, the, director of the film labs like this kid over here all he freaking talks about is building websites y'all should probably just go talk to him <laughs> i've never built a website in my entire life <laughs> um, i've been trying i've been building some personal stuff playing around but i've never launched any of them so this company called me and i went in there and i literally took my lease from from my uh house i was renting you know my, my duplex rewrote the lease typed it all up rewrote it as a contract walked in there and sold them a retainer for 350 bucks a week, which I was all the world and all the money in the world for me as a, as a 20 year old college student, um, sold them a retainer. And as soon as I got access to their code, it took me about 15 minutes to hack it and steal all the credit cards. Um, and what would happen is, is the orders would come in and then they would be downloaded by the guy that built the website and he would fax them to the business to actually mm -hmm. process the orders. Yep. And the fax had all the credit card information sure. on it. And then they would just file them away 
they are in the PCI cabinet. compliant. All, it was very, oh, they, very PCI did not exist <laughs> at all. Nope, I remember similar yeah. stories. Yeah, when did it come guys. out? You think early two thousands, maybe two thousand five or something? It was early, probably two thousands. Yeah, it was probably, but even then, those size businesses didn't adhere to it probably till twenty ten or so. Yeah, I mean, um, even now, I would bet you there's a, still a big chunk of non PCI compliant businesses just because you know <laughs> maybe are you going to run background checks on everybody that comes in and has that, access to that's what i'm saying no. two million shopify sites and you know probably yeah. 10 million sites just in the u.s alone that technically run credit cards and well, you know, I'll, you know. I'll just tell you this real quick <laughs> just as an aside and i'll let you continue but we uh, when i worked i'll mention ll bean for this one because it's so long ago they probably won't be angry with me but when they were <laughs> when they were like getting their first website up which was like a yahoo store and i was working catalog stuff it was around the same time 99 and they uh they would send uh e they would have emails print out uh over in co the call center with full credit card information from the website because they had issues with like having transactions go through so basically call center had to hand type in you know all of these things and there are all these documents it was like sent by email printed out call center typing 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 it was just unbelievable that that's what was going on i have no idea exactly when that ended but that was around 99 also <laughs> so i want to go back to something you said because i think it's actually really important which is frankly you're right b2b is kind of boring and that's that's why one of the reasons we started this podcast was like there's a million b2c podcasts i'm not gonna rank i can't compete with you know the shopify guy you know the one that i think you've probably seen that one there's like a bunch of there, there are a lot of good ones there's right? a I've really good them. b2c retail marketing commerce podcast and i was like i i looked the only b2b podcast b2b e-commerce podcast i could find there's one by um the guy who just stopped and he ended up getting uh working for salsify and he, he shut his down hmm. um so it was like six episodes and then it just stopped <laughs> and then the other one was um what's it called uh remember the former magento guy that split off and started the b2b platform uh, oh, I feel like you don't hear about them too much anymore. Kinda... About, was that Roy Rubin or Yoav? No, no Yoav. Yo Oro Yo Commerce. Yo Oro, Oro Commerce. Yeah. So they had one. But they had like eight episodes, and I'm pretty sure half of it was them just talking about stuff they did. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I, like, I kind of want to hear like more objective news stories, not just like, hey, we built Magento and like, you know. <laughs> um, so there was almost nothing out there. Like literally, and I think part of it is because one, it's boring. But the point I want the one point I want to make is that because it's not like I think a good word is used. It's not it's sexy. Like that's why there's also a lot of gaps. I think in these companies where they don't attract, you know, savvy digital talent that are building these like cutting edge B two B commerce experiences because they all want to go work for like Peloton or whatever. Like. You know, if you're an e-commerce guy and you get a job offer from like Peloton or whatever, I'm just making that up. I don't know why that came to mind, but sure. <laughs> you know, some cool like flashy retail company or like you know Bob's uh, you know warehouse supply company. Like, which job are you going to take? Right? Like, <laughs> so I think there's there's something to that, and maybe almost, and I'm kind of talking, thinking out loud here, it's like, maybe what they, these companies need to do is say, all right, maybe, maybe let's not, we're not going to get that guy, but let's get the technical guy who likes challenges, who likes solving complex problems, is maybe enough of a people person to communicate with the different departments, has enough marketing knowledge to kind of understand what's going on, doesn't have to be the marketing guru of the world. To your point, like, you don't need to have the flashiest things in the world. You need to just have the logistical things working, which seems like most of these people don't. Right. Is that, uh, how do you, how do you feel about that kind of approach of maybe just trying to kind of recruit some, someone that's passionate about solving complex problems and, and giving them that power to do that. You know what I mean? Like that's, I think that's a great approach because most of the time, if you're a successful organization already, like we're talking a B2B organization at scale, your problems with e-commerce are technical. They're not really marketing problems. Mm -hmm. They yeah. are figuring out, you know, all the systems at play and making sure things move through and really understanding the, the buyers and what they need and, and how we can best provide that to them. 
Um, so for instance, you, you asked a little while ago about a, a sexy example. I, I wouldn't call this a sexy example, but one of the projects we've got coming up that I'm most excited about is we, we just signed one that they sell auto parts in a B2B environment, but it is, it's a little different because they sell to large dealership chains and the large dealership chains get a car in and they service the car. So wiper blades and different things yeah, yeah, and, you know, brakes, and then they put it on their lot to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, they, they've got a limited product set, 10,000 products or so they offer, you know, a lot of, a lot of car wash supplies and different things like that. But this is like a very non-standard um, automotive e-commerce site and really diving in and figuring out well, why, why is that? I guess I'd want to, why? Well, it's, it not? it's not, we're not trying, typically in automotive, you're going to have one of several things. You're either focused on a very small subset of cars. Um, you sell things just for vintage BMWs, right? Yeah. And so you limit your product set. You're, you're like the top guy that sells vintage BMW right. like So parts. you're selling to enthusiasts <laughs> though, right? Yeah. You're selling to enthusiasts of a particular uh, brand or niche of cars, or you're selling aftermarket and you've trying to put, you're trying to put half a million products through the site because you have no idea what people are going to be looking for, right? There, there are 10 million different truck combinations out there. And then there's products for all it's of just those. a volume play. You're so just you've like, got, yeah, you're, yeah. you're just trying to get people in randomly and then you're hoping you've got something to offer them. Would you say that's kind of like, you know, for the layman person, is that kind of like a uh, advanced auto parts kind of website type thing where it's like, it can be right. That's more like repair parts, but that's similar. That is similar. Yeah. Aftermarket is more, I'm not trying to fix my vehicle. I'm trying to accessorize it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm buying a brush guard from a truck, a toolbox mm -hmm. or uh, fender flares or, you know, a, sure. a um, camper shell or something like that. So um, that's just, you, you have huge skew counts on that. And, and those are, we run into those a lot. Those two where you've got huge skew counts and you're trying to appeal to the masses, you may niche it down to say, we're about Jeeps or we're about four wheel drive or we're selling, you know, VW parts or something like that. Yeah. But, or exterior. We only do like cool exterior right. type things. Yeah. Automotive yeah. and B2B typically is going to be a distributor. And so yeah. if you're going to do B2B automotive, you're going to be a distributor and people are going to be buying parts to then resale. Um, so to have someone that's actually using the parts and they've got a bunch of different buying centers because these dealerships have dealerships all around the country and all of those dealerships are buying. Um, they've got a couple of different departments. And so I think we can really narrow down the buyer and really understand their needs and their intent at a level that's a little harder when you're trying to service uh, maybe a, a wider variety of- I see. So, so what's unique here is you know very sure it's the procurement guy, whatever you want to call it, yep. the guy at the dealership that has this specific, I need to get it this way, I need to know how it works and get it into the system. And The goal is not to find a bunch of new buyers. We've got the buyers, they're mm -hmm. locked in and we can really understand them at a much deeper level because they're, they're reordering constantly. You've got, you know, one or a set of people at each dealership that is just continuously reordering parts for whatever vehicles they've gotten in. Interesting. Okay. And that's just a fun new challenge, right? Rather yeah. than somebody comes and orders once, maybe you try to get them to order three or four times to become a regular customer. This person's going to be ordering daily or weekly. But see, I think this is a classic example of a challenge of B2B is that part of it is just we're too comfortable, right? You've been around, you got your basic customers and they just, they're going to order from you. And it's like, well, why do I need to invest all this money to make it better for them to order for me when they already order for me, right? I feel like that is part of, you know, and, and, and there's not enough sense of urgency because, you know, maybe they're going to leave you for someone else, but you, but see, I, you see where I'm going with that? But this I'll, this I'll business is, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I'll, I'll just give you this and throw it back to you. I mean, I, I worked with JC Whitney. I mean, you guys might know them at one point. And uh, they, they were trying to figure out like, you know, they had these rabid customers who were buying whatever, like BMW parts, right? They're focused on a particular area. What they did is they created these like rooms for them or sub accounts. So it would be like, you know, TJ's account and then for each car, 
right? Or each vehicle for TJ. So you would have like this area you could go to in your account that would be like TJ's BMW versus TJ's pickup truck, right? And you can keep seeing what you're adding to each. They would recommend based on each profile. That changed a lot of things for them. Uh, it really was something that was that was great. And you can imagine the how powerful that would be, you know, in certain B two B settings. You know, pretty great. Well, we we call that garage functionality, and in B two B, it's a little less prevalent because usually in B two B, you're not buying for the same car. Um, and in yeah. and in the enthusiast site, that's fantastic. On on B two B. Oftentimes it's different every time. Yeah, right? but for, for B2B, the application that I've seen uh, recently has to do with like facilities management and stuff. Uh, here's my account that's a hospital versus my account that's a school. And I'm outfitting each yeah. of these or designers, those kinds of things where you're getting all the different product for each and keeping it. So yeah, it's it's the same concept, but it's, a, it's developed really dramatically in the last few years. I kind of like it. But to go back to Isaiah's point there on us getting kind of lazy, this particular merchant, the reason we're engaged with them now is a very similar story. They were happy doing it like they were doing it. People were calling in, they were faxing in orders, and their largest customer, a major automotive chain said, you will have a digital way for us to order by this date or we will no longer order from you. Wow. And so they, they then threw up a website like it's a basic website, but it allows them to go in and order. Um, and they're like, okay, we throw up a basic website just to meet this so we can continue to get orders from them because it was pretty short notice. But now we need to make this good so that we can basically be their go-to, right? We can take this major chain and we can be their go-to and then we can leverage this to go out and and maybe attract other businesses like or new so, yeah people that maybe like oh yeah. sweet this is a really convenient portal for me to buy from exactly yeah. so they were forced into it but now that they're forced into it they understand the possibilities and they're all in on trying to leverage it to grow the business so what's interesting to me i think this is a really important point is i think this is most likely going to happen to every single vertical in b2b in the next 10 years i think you're going to see especially in the larger businesses that are so, you know, they're probably looking at the time it costs to place all their orders and like, ah, we need to automate these things and we need more visibility. If they're all going to start saying that at one point or another, whether it's this year, next year, five years, you know, there's going to be a period where like you're, you become too late, right. Or you yeah. kind of miss the boat on this. So it sounds like what, what the story is do it before you get the one month notice <laughs> from your customer, you know, like. Well, when there's a negative motivation for a project, it's never a good thing, right? When it's, I'm afraid to lose, or I am going to lose this customer if I don't do this, that's never a real strong motivating factor to try to grow your business. It should always be, how can we better service our customers? How can we go out and find new customers now that we're better servicing them? That should always be the motivation. And if you wait until you're forced into it, one, you're way behind, and two, you're going to make mistakes so that you don't do it real well. So, but I think part of the reason that might be happening is because in B2C, it was much more obvious, right? It's like Amazon, like you just see these websites, everyone's buying from them, everyone's talking about, but like in B2B, it might be happening. You don't even know it's happening because right. your competitor has this yeah. like portal. It could be like an amazing portal, but it could be like behind closed doors. So who knows what it's like when you log into that thing, right? Unless you get like an account and then, you know, it's almost like it's like kind of like this sneaky thing that's happening behind the scenes and all of a sudden it's going to be too late if you don't adapt, right? Is it, It's kind of. It is much more in private. Yeah. The, the evolution, the improvements that your competitors are making are much quieter than if it was on a B2C site, for sure. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, and our listeners have probably heard bits, seen bits and pieces of this in their own work, but there was a, a company I was talking to, they, uh, a client of theirs, right? This is B2B, manufacturing vitamins and nutritional supplements, right? A client of theirs sent a, a deck of screenshots of a, of a competitor's account like dashboard to get in and make purchases and said, why can't you be more like this? It was completely not, it was not requested. This came out of the blue. The client said, we would prefer it if you were like this. 
And I ended up seeing the deck because they're like, how do we do this, right? And it's like, oh my God, somebody actually did it. So you're right, I say, like a lot of these things are often like behind the scenes and you don't quite know what people are up to. But once in a while, a client is motivated enough. It's like, you know what, this is easy and this is not. And I want it to be easy. Well, I do so, think it's going to get more public. I think mm -hmm. B2B companies are going to realize, why am I keeping all this shit behind closed doors? Open mm -hmm. it up. You know, if you don't want to, you know, you can always do login for pricing. Get your stuff out there because that's good marketing, right? If I can find these accessories and see that I could buy it from the auto parts guy, like that's marketing. And yeah. I think that they're... Part of it also is they've never had to do digital marketing at the scale that B2C has. So they've never really put the effort into that, you know, to, to your point about that B2C is way ahead because it's just, it is their business. Whereas B2B, it's like, oh, our salespeople will call people. It's finer. So I've asked people in B2B how they get customers and it's like crickets. And then eventually they're like, well, I guess Google. <laughs> they just find us. It's magic. Find yeah. And I'm like, literally, it was like crickets. And then they're like, well, they search us on Google. I'm like, so do you guys have like an SEO plan? If that's how all your customers are finding you, like, how are you? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> literally, it's like, well, we're one of the few people that sell this thing. That's that's their marketing plan. I, a lot of times it is that we are the niche in BMW, like you said, or whatever. We are the niche in this. And there's like three guys and we have our territories. A lot of times what's ridiculous. And I think that I, I, I can't believe that this will last much longer is that they just basically are in business because the manufacturer gave them a territory and they have a monopoly on that territory. Oh, yeah. Like I, I, I don't see that model lasting much longer. Because why, as a manufacturer, would I give exclusive rights when eventually I could just sell through my own website or, find, you know, go direct? Like, it just doesn't seem like that makes sense to me for much longer for these businesses. And I feel like it's not, it's not something that'll be around the 20 years, maybe 10, maybe five. I, I don't know. But I just don't see the exclusive distribution rights being a smart business model for much longer. You may be overestimating how fast these businesses move, but yeah, it's definitely not a favorable model for the consumer. Um, it's not a favorable model for the manufacturer. So I, I don't know why that would continue to be, but you know, a lot of these are, a lot of these models, a lot of these businesses are pretty well entrenched with that. And it just takes a lot to make that change. What's interesting is that I notice it's much more entrenched in the U.S. So we're working with a company and they're like, all, all gung-ho in, in other countries because they don't have the restrictions that they have here. And what I think might also happen is once some of these companies open the floodgates in other countries, they're like, holy crap, why don't we just do this here? Why don't we just do this in right. the U.S. too? Yeah. Right? Because they're like, well, our margins are triple. Because we're going direct. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden you realize like, hey, we don't need all this like middleman infrastructure. Not saying that there's no need for it at all, but I just think it's going to change at some point in terms of how it's being handled. Well, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm so glad that things are changing. And I think you're right, TJ. In, in some ways we can, you know, overestimate if that's the right word, like how quickly things will change, right? I mean, I, I, there was a years ago, I was working with a watch company and I was actually doing sales for them and they had it, the whole territory system and it was fascinating, like how this worked. And it's like, well, you know, in order, for, if, even if you like exceed your goals of this territory, you cannot go sell over to the people of this territory. It's like, but wait, I'm a great salesperson. Like, what, is, what are you doing to me? Right? It didn't make any sense even from that level, right? It was just kind of this bizarre Thing. It's like, well, I'll just go sell more elsewhere, right? Like, why do I need to be with you? And so it's it's fascinating to just ask that now of these B2B companies. It's like, why are you doing this? You know, and they need to think about it. And as it goes back to what we said earlier on, a lot of the younger people coming into these businesses in any role are going to be looking at things a little bit differently based on growing up with all of these tech and tools around them for other reasons, right? And they're going to want to apply, you know, some of that to what they're up to. Well, I think you made a good point where there's some things that do take long. You're like, oh, there's no way it's going to still be doing this 10 years and then people are still faxing. <laughs> Facts still exist, right? Like 
you have some of these things that just like stick around for way too long. But I also think there's the other side of that where all of a sudden Uber just killed taxis, right? And, you know, you have some of these things that do come up just massively change an entire industry in like a matter of five, 10 years, like, a, like Tesla kind of, you know, I mean, like, it's, might not be too long before Tesla is the number one car seller in the, U, in the world. I wonder what that, I think that date will happen relatively soon in that they will sell more cars than anyone else. They're going to have to get the price down. They have to get the price down. Yeah. I they mean, will. But yeah, I mean, they've already got the model three. Uh, it's, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, you don't think that he's thinking about that. Like I'm sure Elon Musk is like, all right, in five you know, years, I'm going to, yeah. I, I'm with you partly, at least on this. I don't know if Tesla, I mean, I think that they're, they're, they're kind of leading the way, you know, in a lot of these things. I don't know if they're going to be that big because everybody else is doing electric too Volkswagen well he's gonna have to to get his price his stock you know keep getting the stock up there so mm -hmm. he's gonna eventually have to hit mass mass market maybe get, he's listening right price. now he wants to buy our podcast <laughs> right maybe i mean you can't like only sell you know to the top five percent of the economy to and and keep the stock price at two trillion or whatever he's gonna eventually have to hit before people get pissed off you know <laughs> the, the great thing is is that a lot of the manufacturers are moving toward him on the price point so he doesn't have to continue to push too far down. That's what I mean. I mean everyone, else is electrical, everyone else's electric vehicles are going up. In yeah, price. they're like a lot of them are. I mean, you can't probably what are the Leafs or what are the other ones? They're still what, 30, 40 grand. I mean, maybe less. I mean, it's probably not much less than 30. Right. I doubt you can get much. So, yeah. And if he's getting and if he's getting this kind of monopoly on some of these like battery things, he can probably outcompete some of them. You know, well, I, I don't know how far you want to get into electric cars on a, on a beat <laughs> podcast. My, my concern with electric cars and their viability long term really come from the secondary market, the used market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's growing up in Alabama, small town, there are a lot of people around here that depend on their thousand dollar, fifteen hundred dollar beater. Mm -hmm. And if a used car is going to need a 15 or a $20,000 battery replacement, when that goes out, then that's going to have an economic impact, right? That's what is, what is that impact? I don't know. It is very strange because I noticed with Tesla, I don't know anyone that's bought a used Tesla at all. You like, don't want to use Tesla because it, you literally, you could pay $20,000 for the car. And you could literally have twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs at any. Minute. So you might as well just buy the new one. It's, that's why. That's why no one has a use. There's like there are no use Tesla. I mean, there are, but nobody really wants them, right? So I, so I don't I'm know gonna, how that's going to play. That's, I'm going to. Yeah, oh, go ahead, TJ. Go no, ahead. I, I was done. No, I was just going to circle us back and let you have some of the final words on uh, yeah, yeah. And, and what you're up to. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that we. We make sure all of our listeners get a, a you know a great this, sense of let's how let's get this video and the yeah. video announcement out so everyone knows when is the next oh thing. the video announcement <laughs> hopefully week after next we're we're changing up our video strategy a little bit but I've got uh, a comparison between Salesforce Commerce Cloud and Adobe Commerce coming Ooh. out so it's a four video series where we go into Adobe Commerce then we go into Salesforce Commerce Cloud and then. We have one video for each as to why you would choose that platform over the other one. If you don't mind me asking, how did you get the knowledge? Because I know you don't, you guys don't do Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Did you bring in an expert or how are you even getting the knowledge enough to? Oh, that's a trade secret. Now you're asking for <laughs> secrets. <laughs> that's okay. You, you, as long as you're just saying there's a way that we did it, I just want, I'm assuming we you have something. someone that does the research on that. Um, okay. We've, we've hired someone that's very experienced in platform comparison analysis has, has actually worked with some of the platforms as their competitive analyst. Mm -hmm. And so we, we leverage their knowledge and their research. And, and obviously there's only so far we can go with that comparison. I'm, I have very deep knowledge of Adobe commerce. That's an easy one to write. The two Adobe videos took no time whatsoever. Uh, the Salesforce videos, we did a lot of research because we really want to be fair. We want to give a fair comparison. We don't want to that's say what, that's kind of what I'm asking. True. Yeah. Um, we don't want yeah. to say anything that's not fair to that platform. Like our, our goal is to have folks end up on the platform that's right for them, whether that's right for us or not. 
uh, because obviously if they choose Salesforce, we're not going to build the site. It really is. I mean, it does feel like Adobe is becoming more like Salesforce Commerce Cloud. I really, it's probably a much, I mean, I think Shopify and Big Commerce are much more similar now than, than even I would say Adobe. And, and um, it seems like Adobe and Salesforce are really going up in terms of the market and there's- Yeah, and um, I mean, Salesforce obviously being a flexible, ish you know pr pretty flexible SaaS platform mm -hmm. um obviously adobe still being open source but really moving more towards some SaaS models with a lot of i more mean like releases. price point when i say that i more um, mean like price point and size of customer yeah but the the architecture often tells you what kind of customer they're going after mm -hmm. right and so they are building an ecosystem salesforce has an ecosystem adobe has an ecosystem and they they are very much building their e-commerce platforms to try to sell to businesses that need the whole ecosystem and not just um, the commerce. And I'm not saying you can't build on just the commerce, but the people who need the Adobe ecosystem are large customers because that experience manager license really will eat <laughs> into your bourbon budget. There you, go. <laughs> you might not have a bourbon budget after. Uh... I would most definitely not have a bourbon budget. <laughs> do, you, do you include a bourbon budget line in all of your agreements? Is that something I've I heard? should, I really should. I, you know, I don't know if that would cost me any deals at this point. Um, most people mention it. Most people want me to send them bourbon so I might need to, you know, like bourbon gifting fee or something in, like in every that. contract. I like that. That's good. That's good. Well, you know, I, I really am enjoying this. I think we do need to do another episode at some point and just kind of circle around some other issues and dive in a little, uh, you know, a little. Let's bit dive better. into some verticals next time. I mean, it obviously got yeah, a really deep good. background in, in, in uh, automotive. Let's let's regroup on some verticals. I like the concept of kind of diving in a little deeper into the verticals. Sounds good. I like it too. I like it too. Well, is this the <laughs> end of episode 73 of the hard truth about B2B? It is. It is the only B2B podcast with over 70 episodes. <laughs> only one. Only one. We, we are... no one, no one has the patience to keep it going, right? That's no why, that's why we're getting people from Amazon and others listening to us. I think there's nothing else when they look up B2B e-commerce podcasts. Here we are, right? We do appreciate those two people from Amazon listening all the way to the end. <laughs> We do. We do. We appreciate that. <laughs> writing, they're writing the RFP for us, you know, so that we can, you know. Dude, they, they would just buy you out of petty cash. Really I, I think so. You I know, if they so. offer us enough money, I will consider it. <laughs> well, thank you once again, TJ Campbell from Jamerson. This has been excellent. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys.